hi folks welcome back i hope you're all doing well so today i want to do something a little bit different i usually cover computer science papers on this channel but i've been reading a lot about web3 and crypto recently and i want to talk a little bit about that and try to explain it as best as i can why should you pay attention to my account of this I'm not an expert on Web3 or crypto, but I do have a PhD in computer science and I can read technical stuff and at least try to understand it. So a lot of this is going to be me narrating as I learn. I want to divide this video into two big parts. In the first one, I want to cover the actual underlying tech, how the concepts relate to each other, how it all works. And then in the second part, I'm going to offer some opinions. The definition of the term Web3 is somewhat nebulous, but in terms of what the technical building blocks of it are, the major technical building block, of course, is the blockchain. And then there are a number of concepts that fall out of that. Uh, things like smart contracts, which are built on top of the blockchain, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, DAOs, decentralized, anonymous organizations. But all of these things are built on top of this fundamental data structure, which is the blockchain. I have another video on this channel that looks at the original Bitcoin white paper, and that goes into much more detail on what exactly a blockchain is, how it's structured, how it works, and so on. But at a very high level, the idea of a blockchain is quite simple, really. It's usually a very simple data structure. It could be a linked list or a tree. But the main twist is that the links are cryptographically secured. So every node in the linked list contains a hash of all previous nodes. And this makes the entire chain essentially immutable. Now, this idea is actually pretty old. It's based on the idea of a Merkle tree. However, the central innovation that Bitcoin brought to the table was not the technology or the data structure, but the set of incentives on top of it so that the world as a whole can agree on the one true blockchain. There's an old saying in crypto and security, which is that there is no problem in crypto you can't solve by using a trusted third party. And Satoshi Nakamoto introduced this concept of proof of work, which means that to add a new block onto the blockchain, you have to do a small amount of computational work. It's manageable, but it's still enough that it makes it infeasible to forge the entire history of the blockchain up to that point because you would have to do that amount of work for every block in the historical chain. This is what is known as proof of work. And the situation that it leads to is that in order for someone to overtake the blockchain, they would have to redo all the work in all the previous blocks on the chain. This is also sometimes known as a 51% attack because you would have to summon the majority of the computational power of the entire network in order to take over the blockchain. So Bitcoin was the first viable blockchain with the Bitcoin currency on top of it, but it was rather simple in that Bitcoin was the only thing that it handled. This was soon followed by Ethereum and the Ethereum blockchain. And Ethereum's main new innovation was the idea of smart contracts. Now the name smart contracts is somewhat of a misnomer because these are not exactly contracts and it doesn't really explain what's going on. But you can essentially think of the Ethereum blockchain as a blockchain that allows the execution of code. One of the main new innovations of Ethereum over the Bitcoin blockchain is this idea of an Ethereum virtual machine and modeling the Ethereum blockchain as a global state transition from one block to the next. And the way this state transition happens is by executing code. The Ethereum VM, the Ethereum virtual machine, is what executes this code. 
and if you look into the details of the ethereum vm it is a fairly straightforward stack based virtual machine similar to the java virtual machine in that sense with stack operations arithmetic operations call operations and so on but the main idea is that when you go from one block to the next block the ethereum vm can execute a given piece of code and you can manage not just ethereum but other state so you could for example define a totally new currency coin that you made up on top of the ethereum blockchain and the way that new coin would get managed is by code that you write that gets executed in the ethereum virtual machine where exactly does this virtual machine lives it lives on every ethereum client and this happens whenever they add a new block to the blockchain but the central incentive structure remains the same it's still based on proof of work so this is the central new innovation of ethereum that you have a blockchain which allows some sort of a turing complete computation to happen when you go from one block to another which essentially models a state transition as you go from one block to the next one and if you have a blockchain with a turing complete programming model on top of it you could use it to model pretty much anything there are no limits once you have that one of the main things you can do then is encode some sort of an organizational structure and that's what daos are decentralized autonomous organizations one could for example code up the rules governing an organization how you make decisions how you spend resources within the organization you could define who the members of that organization are how they vote to spend its resources and so on and you can write all this up in code and have the ethereum blockchain execute it and then finally we come to the concept of nfts non-fungible tokens this is perhaps the thing that has received the most hype recently because of the millions and millions of dollars people are spending buying nft art on the ethereum blockchain so let's dig into that a little bit there are two main concepts that underlie an nft and as the name suggests the first one is the idea of being non-fungible or being unique now when you think of ethereum or bitcoin as a currency they are fungible in the sense that one bitcoin is no different than another if i possess one bitcoin that's just a number in my account my one bitcoin has no unique characteristic that separates it from one bitcoin that someone else might possess however with the more generic kind of blockchain that ethereum pioneered there's no reason to be limited to simple numbers or simple fungible currency concepts on the blockchain i could for example encode a totally unique object on the blockchain and that's what the idea of being non-fungible is now what is this thing what is the thing that is non-fungible and it's a pretty general thing it could be anything that's why they call it a token a token can be any unique string and that is what is being used for all this nft art that is transacted on the ethereum blockchain what you're putting on the blockchain is not the piece of art itself but usually it's either some sort of a url to the piece of art or some other unique hash or identifier that can uniquely identify that piece of art i like to think of it as similar to BitTorrent, but with strong cryptographic signatures or BitTorrent that is content addressable note that just because i might have paid a lot of money to buy an nft on the blockchain that does not mean that i'm able to preclude access to that artistic artifact in fact 
anyone else on the web might also be able to view it or enjoy it or even save it locally to their machine. All that is encoded on the blockchain is that there is this unique piece of art which is identified by a unique token and that I paid for it. That is the transaction that gets recorded on the blockchain. All right, so those were some of the underlying technical concepts, at least at a high to medium level. And now I want to offer some opinions on what it all means, what it could possibly do, what is possibly overhyped right now. If you read about Web3, one of the central claims about it, and also one of its central benefits, is that it is decentralized. It is not subject to control by any one entity. And often the way that is interpreted is that it will be outside the realm of control by governments. So this might be technically true. Obviously, no central government can tell you what to put on the blockchain, how to mint new blocks on the blockchain, or what even goes on the blockchain. Yes, that's true. However, it is pretty easy for governments to regulate anything of value that gets transacted on the blockchain and anything of value that goes in and out of the blockchain. For example, Coinbase, which is a major way to hold cryptocurrencies, is already regulated. At least here in the US, Coinbase is required to report gains from cryptocurrency to the IRS. So this is hardly some wild west where you can just hide money from the government. Because at the end of the day, if you hold cryptocurrency, presumably you want to spend it on something of value. You might want to exchange it for dollars. You might want to exchange it for some physical goods. And when you do that, it's very hard to escape bookkeeping and government regulation. But there is one more thing which makes this claim of decentralization somewhat dubious, which is the flood of venture capital money that is entering this space. If VCs are investing money in this space, obviously they want to make a return on it. And money is usually made via centralization. Money is made by building platforms. Money is made by having a choke point or a funnel point where you can extract some fraction of the value that is flowing through the system. So that in itself is a very strong incentive for the financial structures underlying this VC rush to favor centralization. Also, a lot of the commentators about Web3 make it sound like this is some sort of a huge departure from the web as we know it right now. But if you look at it at a technical level, every current web protocol, things like HTTP, TCP, and so on, all the protocols that the web is built on, they are all decentralized. There is nothing inherently centralized about HTTP. In fact, if you read all the early work, especially by people like Tim Berners-Lee and others, on the foundations of the web, one of the main motivations for that work was to have a decentralized network without any single entity controlling the network or without any single entity being able to stop the flow of information in the network. So I feel like these claims about centralization or the lack thereof are not so much a function of the technology itself, but a function of the surrounding financial and societal and legal incentives. At the very bottom of the stack, when all is said and done, someone is running a computer to serve up all this stuff. These are all just CPUs and disks behind a network connection, and someone has to run them and manage them and pay for them and maintain them. All right, so a couple of other points. One of the other things that comes up a lot when talking about Web3 and blockchain is its use as a decentralized database. And I find this to be dubious because at least the way this is currently structured, the blockchain is just simply horrendous as a database. You wouldn't want to use it as a database in the traditional sense of the word, the sort of thing you 
use MySQL or Postgres or a relational database for. It's just not technically structured to offer those kinds of guarantees or latency or reliability. So I think that whole line of reasoning about using it as a decentralized database, at least right now, is somewhat dubious. My final point has to do with immutability. One of the central advantages that is touted for the blockchain is that is immutable. Once you have a block in the history of the blockchain, that's it. It is set in stone forever. All the links further down the blockchain only reinforce this old block and you can't change it. And it's public, so the entire world has a record of it and you can't change it anymore after the fact. However, immutability is a double-edged sword, especially when you consider the Ethereum blockchain, which also allows you to execute Turing complete code when going from one block to the next. The question is, what do you do about bugs in your smart contract? If you have a bug in your smart contract that pays someone more than you want it to, or makes an incorrect decision, those bugs are also irreversible. And this actually happened back in 2016. There was a bug on a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain, which drained about $150 million worth of Ethereum out of the blockchain. And the solution at the time was to do a hard fork of the entire chain. So they rewound the chain to just before the bug, fixed the bug, and then pretended as if it had never happened. But that was a non-technical solution. It really undercut this idea of the blockchain being immutable. So I feel like for smart contracts to be more viable or to be more meaningful, they would need to get paired with some concept of code correctness. So I might sound like I'm very critical of Web3 and crypto in general, but that's not really the case. My goal really is to explain the tech as it is today so that we can understand what it really is capable of and to try and filter through some of the hype. I hope you found that useful and I will see you all next time. Thank you very much.